<laughs> okay, okay. Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Um, this is David Park, CEO of Beat the GMAT again. We're really sorry about the technical difficulties you experienced. Um, as I said before, this is the HBS essay admissions, admissions essay workshop. We're really excited to have Jeremy Scheinwald here. And so, uh, Jeremy, please uh, restart your presentation so you can just keep going. So, sorry, guys. Am I, am I starting from the beginning or am I starting from where I left off? I think you can start with the first slide um, because people couldn't read that slide at all. Okay, so people could people could hear me, but they couldn't see this. So we're still yes. on the same slide. Um, and so, yeah, I was just talking about how um, there are a lot of myths out there. I think people, you know, perceive they're they're too old and and um, or too young, and it's it's just something you you can't change your birth certificate. So you may as well apply. I think that the next big worry we find before people even start applying and they start trying to figure out ways to get in touch with an alumnus and and uh, to start networking. And alumni don't get you into get don't get you, get you into Harvard. There are far more alumni than there are students. There are only 900 students a year. You know, alum, each alumnus does not have a claim on you. Having an alumni alumnus in your corner is really not going to make that big a difference if you're if you know if you're not a good candidate, it's not going to pull you in. If you're a great candidate, it's, it's not going to make that much of a difference. So, um, you know, you, you shouldn't worry about that too much. The other thing is that um, a lot of people worry that they didn't go to Harvard or didn't go to Yale or didn't go to the Ivy League or Stanford or whatever it is. You don't need to go to those schools to get into Harvard. And um, I actually wrote an admissions myth for Beat the GMAT on this where we had some stats. I think it was – I think I, – I have to go back actually to my article, but um, I think it was that Harvard had accepted students over the last three years from 485 different institutions. And um, – and so, you know, there's, there, there were I, le I went through the list. There were many, many schools that I, as an admissions consultant, had never even heard of. So you shouldn't worry about your institution. You should worry about performance. And then I think a lot of people worry that the guy beside me is applying. You know, I'm at McKinsey, and there's another guy from McKinsey applying, and how many McKinsey guys are they going to take? Or I'm at J.P. Morgan. And, and, and um, you know, I, again, this is something when I was at Harvard, um, I asked Dee Leopold about this, and, and she said, uh, you know, she, she sort of j joked. I mean, she said there's room for, for Sergey and for Larry talking about the Google founders. You know, basically what she was saying is there are two people who are really great, then they have room for them. It doesn't matter if they have similar experiences. So these are some of the big concerns people have once they decide that Harvard is for them. But again, you know, we, we really think that people should, should, uh, should get beyond the brand at times and think about whether the environment is for them as well. Um, and then I think this is really important. As you, as you uh, complete your application, you know, don't worry if you're not a Superman. Uh, don't worry if you're not an Olympic skier or, you know, you, don't worry that you didn't found Facebook. There was actually an interview pu uh, published the other day with Dee Leopold where she said that one of her biggest peeves as an admissions director is when people trump up their applications and they say, I was crucial on a $500 billion deal. And, um, you know, you don't need to be crucial in a $500 billion deal, and, and especially if you weren't. And so, you know, you, you, you have to focus more, um, you know, more on, on, you know, on who you are, what your story is, and how you did the commonplace things remarkably well. And that's really, that's really where I think a lot of people go wrong, and, and it, it leads directly into – who should I be for HBS, or what is the HBS way? And the same, the same way you'd respect, most of you, I'm assuming, respect the GMAT and recognize there isn't, you know, there are a lot of, of uh, people out there who talk about, you know, GMAT tricks and codes that you're going to crack. The truth of the matter is you have to respect the GMAT. It's not just a game. You have to do, you have to do the learning. And the same thing with an application. There's no code you have to crack. There's no... Um, you know, there's no, you know, if you mention the word private equity in the seventh line, a trap door opens up and you fall into the class. Um, it just doesn't work that way. So uh, you have to be thinking to yourself, and this is a quote directly from Delia Leopold from that interview again, um, you know, there are a lot of consultants who tell people what a business school wants to hear. And, you know, she's saying you shouldn't be asking that question. It should be what do you want to say as an applicant. I really couldn't agree any more. Um, we don't help people game the admissions process. We help them represent themselves in a way that is interesting and distinct. And then I think people worry that HBS plays tricks, that, you know, they don't ask why HBS, that you have to slip it into every question, that, you know, they make the career goals question optional, but, you know, you, you really have to answer the career goals because if you don't answer the career goals, why do you apply to business school? And you really just have to take them for, you have to take the questions for what they are. 
and just say, okay, I'm going to answer these questions. I'm going to represent myself in a way that is interesting and not, not worry about some game that you perceive that to, be, to be going on that isn't. And, um, you know, really, like, don't answer – in particular, don't pander and say, you know, oh, I could have done this better had I gone to HBS or whatever it is. Just, just answer the questions as they ask them. If they wanted to hear how you could have improved an experience, um, you know, had you gone to HBS, they'd ask you. And then, you know, here's, here's a, a big myth out there. People say, you have to develop your brand. I need to constantly reinforce one story. I need to be, you know, I need to be Jeremy the entrepreneur in everything I do. And if you think about great business leaders, they're not one-dimensional. You know, Bill Gates is, is, a, is a championship bridge player. He's, a, he's an innovative philanthropist. He's a wonderful entrepreneur. You know, and, and this is only what we know about him, you know. And, and so... You know, they're not looking for you to be one thing. And if you, if you, in fact, it's quite the opposite. If you keep offering the same thing over and over again, we'll get to this later in the presentation, um, you're going to bore the admissions committee. So don't try and force a theme on your application that doesn't exist. So the first thing that I would say, and I, I think it goes, goes along with what I just said, don't try and force a theme on your application. Don't try and fit your story, particularly in the leadership. We, we see candidates who will say, um, you know, HBS is about leadership, and I need to tell them a story about leadership and everything I do. And instead of saying, okay, you know, what does HBS want to hear, and how can I, how can I, um, you know, arrive at that at that image? Um, I think you know a much better better way of doing this is just saying, okay, I've got to I've got to brainstorm and think about what's interesting about myself, and then and then figure out how the, how these how these stories of myself fit into the HBS questions. So. Here's a simple example. This is this is based on, um, you know, this, this is based on on a, on a candidate we'd worked at. It's a disguise case, but of a candidate who got into Harvard, and um, you know, again, not an Olympic skier. You know, didn't found Facebook. Here's a guy who just did everything. He you know seized every opportunity and did things quite well. Um, you know, remarkably well. And so he was a project manager, and he was managing a variety of, of uh, he was managing a variety of projects. We just focused on one, where uh, just for for purposes of this of this uh, exercise, of course, you know, when you're doing your brainstorming, go through all of your projects. But um, you know, he had a he had a, a team that was dispersed across a couple of different offices, working together. Um, they were working with a with a uh, with a client um, who uh, was going through some the client's. The, the company itself is going through tough times. Um, so, you know, how did you forge a unified team of seven? Maybe there's a story there. Maybe not. You know, these are the questions I would ask. Did any team member, maybe instead of focusing on the team itself, did any team member require special attention? Maybe there's one person who he worked with particularly closely to develop their skills, or in this case, as you'll see in the next slide, rein in someone who was a high, a high achiever. Um, what was your relationship like with your client? Well, the client was, was demoralized, as we see. You know, how do you motivate someone to work with you uh, who is demoralized? Do you face any ethical issues? You know, you've got multiple clients in the same space um, sharing information. Um, how did you manage your project internally? You know, if you're always off-site and you've got all these people, what was your, what was your relationship with your, with your own boss like? And these are just each one of these. I'm not saying each one's going to become an essay, but if you look at a single project from as many different angles, multidimensional brainstorming, you're going to try to find the story that stands out, and if you do that with each project, for, you know, not just this one, but each project the project manager uh, managed, and in this case, he was a health committee leader, um, he was on the board of a local theater, and he considered himself to be an absolutely remarkable grandson, we'll get to that in a second, and I think there might be some, thankfully there's no volume on this, because there might be the occasional guffaw when you say that, but you shouldn't ignore your personal life, and uh, and sometimes a pers your personal life can be um, you know, a story that only you can, can provide only a, uh, can provide a, a story that only you can tell, and that's something that um, you know a lot of people ignore. And that kind of distinction is, is really important. So, you know, looking at this individual story, just breaking it down. Um, you know, this individual lobbied the, his client and created incentives for demoralized employees to complete work. So maybe that's a good story. You know, again, not not each one of the questions on the previous slide generated a story, but managed a high performer's ego and facilitated growth while balancing team interests. Completed key projects ahead of schedule. Earned follow-on business that a demoralized employee was the only PM to do so. Um, you know, he started a, he started the company's health committee. He overcame internal skepticism and developed a fitness program with no budget. Conducted wellness retreats with another firm, and uh, and and was in the midst of launching a salad uh, challenge with in, in his firm and starting weekly yoga. You know, again, this is not you know this 
not the stuff that, that legends are made of. This is just someone who is seizing opportunity and making his difference. Um, I'll, I'll skip the theater board. Um, you know, I don't want to go through each one of these, but the standout grandson, um, this, in this case, this individual's grandmother couldn't travel alone, and he took her to Hungary for one week. You know, that's, that's not just a normal, you know, level of dedication. This is something that's really remarkable and created, creates a bit of a story. So then you go and you say, okay, I've got all these stories. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to arrange them as, as in, you know, such. I mean, I understand where I shine and where I don't. So this person selected four, four essays. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to arrange them in a way where, okay, now I know all my options for my three accomplishments. I know all my options for my mistake. Um, you know, managing a high performer's ego, facilitating growth while balancing team interests. Well, I made some mistakes along the way in managing this, this person's ego. Um, you know, I had a, I'm introducing myself. Okay, I've got all these options, you know, these, these, these stories that, that might seem interesting as I introduce myself. Three accomplishments, I've got six options there. And really, I put a little star beside the ones that we used for this individual. And, and again, you know, the, the, next, the, next, the last two are, are new, so this is what we, we likely would have done. Um, but, you know, the key in general is to keep the admissions committee learning about you. And, again, I think that a lot of people choose to, um, to offer – um, you, you know, say, okay, this is business school. I've got to offer business in, in every single thing I do, or I've got to offer leadership in everything I do. And that's, that's not the re – there's no recipe. You know, the admissions committee wants to understand that you're a, a sophisticated individual, and you want to keep them learning about you as you go along. So, um, you know, if you, if you look at, um, you know, these, these, different, these different areas here, you know, you're, you've got one at work, you've got one – it's also at work, but it's in a very different area. You know, one is completing a project. It's a different area. Eric, are you there? Yeah, we, we cut out for a second. Okay, should I, am I back? Yes, you're back. Okay, I'm back, okay. So number two is, is one thing that's interesting, you know, I'm talking about keeping the admissions committee learning. Number two is, uh, is about, you know, a key project. This is your formal business experience. Number four is, sure, you're, you're still keeping the admissions committee learning over the, even though your, your, your accomplishment overcoming internal skepticism and developing a fitness program with no budget, it still physically occurs at work, but it's a very different side of your experience. It's internally focused. It has to do with, with personal leadership and fitness as opposed to helping a client. So it, it still works in terms of keeping the admissions committee learning. Um, and so the goal is to say, okay, with, with each one of my accomplishments, I'm revealing a, you know, a different side. Now I'm moving to a mistake, and they're going to say, wow, okay, you know, here's, here's, um, here's a guy who, um, you know, who managed a high performer's ego. You know, he made some mistakes along the way, and you know, we're learning something new about him or navigating a difficult theater board. It, the idea is that we're, you know, as you go along, you've got the inventory necessary to, to keep introducing the, the, the admissions committee to you in a different way, and that's, that's really important because once they stop learning – it gets, it gets boring for them. They've read a lot of these things. So let's move to the essays themselves. Um, so here are the essays. I'm sure that people here are familiar with them. I saw them on, uh, on Be at the GMAT's ad. Um, what are your three most substantial accomplishments, and why do you view them as such? So three mini-essays within a 600-word limit. Those have always been there. It's a real favorite of the admissions committee. Um, D. Leopold actually spoke at the AGAC conference, uh, which Eric was at, and said uh, she talked about how you know, people reminisce about them at, at reunions, and, and uh, so it's, it's probably here to stay. Um, what have you learned from mistake? That's been a that's been around for I guess about four years now, and then the options tend to uh, tend to tend to vary from year to year. Um, what would you like the MBA admissions board to know about your undergraduate academic experience? It's been there for a while. What is your career vision, and why is this choice meaningful? And then you know, again, another one that's been there for a while, and that really surprises people that it's optional, but it is, and we certainly help people get in without answering that question. And um, and then the last two are new. Tell us about new this year. Tell about us a t tell us about a time in your professional experience when you were frustrated or disappointed. And when you join the HBS class of 2013, how will you introduce yourself to your new classmates? So, um, what are your three most substantial accomplishments? And I, I I kept these I kept our examples here for you to see. I think the big mistake that people make when they answer this question is they offer something. Very, um, they, they, they start with an approach that is very humdrum and boring. My second greatest accomplishment was stepping in to stave off the bankruptcy of a small theater company and actually helping it return, 
itself to profitability. And what you've done here, A, you've started, as many people will, with my first greatest accomplishment, my second greatest accomplishment. It's, it's a nice way to organize your thoughts. It makes it easier for, easier for you, but everyone starts that way. And you're, 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 you're at risk of lulling someone to sleep. The other thing you do, and this is something we notice a lot, people tell the entire story in the first sentence. My second greatest accomplishment was stepping into stave off the bankruptcy of a small theater company and actually helping it return itself to profitability. What do you what do you say after that? You know, where do you go? So you want to you want to maintain some mystery. Here's the exact same story, but um, you know, with a bit of a launch opening. I joined the board of the Blackjack Theater Company three weeks after a failed audit and the surprise resignation of the executive director. Okay, so so what's going on here? Where does this story go? Okay, you've joined it amid turmoil. Um, you know, I want to find out. I want to follow this to find it to find its way to its resolution. So that's a that's a big thing to avoid. We'll go back to this example in, uh, next. Um, so you really want to launch into your narrative. You want to tell the story. And I think that a lot of people will, will just look at the accomplishment. Like, let's say, um, don't make your accomplishments most basic here. Someone will say, okay, I was the captain of the football team, and that was my accomplishment. I would say, as captain of the football team, what did you do? You're going to get credit in the first line for saying, you know, um, when I served uh, as captain of uh, XYZ football team, I, uh, you know, I, I, whatever, the stories about lobbying for new equipment or whatever, you're going to get obviously get, get an, an implicit credit for being captain. Let's, let's see what you did with it. So don't just offer a minimum. Really launch into a story, grab their attention, and hold it. Um, save something to the story itself. Don't offer the whole story in the first sentence. Don't tell the same story three times. We've gone over that a few times. Um, I was, really, I would stay away from high school entirely unless there was something you know, absolutely remarkable um, you know, that where we'd just be wowed by it now. Um, you know, if you started a business in high school that continues to grow to this day or a nonprofit or something really special, fine. But I would say 99% of high school accomplishments shouldn't be discussed. Um, you know, the, the, the basic question is, what have you done since then? Why, why, why do we have to go back so far to find accomplishment? And, and for a lot of people, the same thing with college. You know, if you're... If you're four or five years out of college, uh, you know, I don't want to give a, a hard and fast number, but the odds of, you know, hopefully you've accomplished something since then as well, um, you know, case-by-case case basis. Um, and, and just really remember to answer, why do you view them as such? Now, when we talk to our to, – to, we do thousands of free consultations every year, and, um, you know, people talk – we talk a lot about how to communicate effectively because, again, that's my background as a speechwriter. I, I have an MBA, but, uh, you know, I think that this is predominantly about communication. Um, and it doesn't mean you need to be a Pulitzer Prize winner. It just means you need to express yourself in a compelling way, and, and that level is different for everyone. Um, but when we when we talk about this essay, a lot of people say, "But you're talking about telling a complete story in six hundred wor- in two hundred words. That's just not possible." I, I have to say, my first, my greatest accomplishment is such and such. So here's the here's the the story of the of the theater company, and I guess I'll, I guess I'll, uh, I'll read it to you. Uh, I joined the board of the Blackjack Theater Company three weeks after a failed audit and the surprise resignation, resignation of the executive director. At my first meeting, I persuaded the board to divide up the names of our 400 subscribers and call each to discuss our commitment to change. I was stunned to learn that only 12 chose not to renew and that 30 actually donated to the Save the Theater campaign. I had initiated. Building on this momentum, I approached area restaurants, which benefit from our 64 nights of use each year, for donations and applied for a government nonprofit stabilization grant, quickly raising $34,350, enough to retire most of our, much of our debt. After eight hours of debate about a new ED, I prevailed in championing Michael, an entrepreneurial minded, entrepreneurially, entrepreneurially minded playwright who emphasized the balance between art and finance. In his first season, Michael assembled a conservative, crowd pleasing schedule, and we broke even. Soon, the board asked me to assume the role of president. I accepted. I had no previous experience in the nonprofit world and take great pride in, in, in having helped save the Blackjack, a 20-year-old civic institution. The worst is now behind us. The main drama at the Blackjack is back on stage where it belongs. And, you know, this is, a, this is a full narrative in 200 words. There's a beginning, a middle, an end. I hope that you found it to be compelling. Um, and, and the best part about it is it just tells – it's an easy way to write. It tells the story as it happened. It's not sophisticated. It's not an adjective contest. I joined the board of the Blackjack Theater Company three weeks after a failed audit. There's nothing sophisticated about that. That's what happened. At my first meeting, I persuaded the board to divide up the names of our 400 subscribers. We're just learning about what you did. When you brainstorm effectively and you identify an interesting story, the story can do the work for you. So 
you know, really focus on that brainstorming. Think about, you know, out, about stories that, that have inherent power and then just let them do the work. Required question two, what have you learned from a mistake? You have to really leave yourself exposed from criticism. And I think this actually relates back to the idea that Harvard is not looking for supermen. They're looking for human beings. If they, they know there's no such thing as a mistake-free individual. And so uh, you really have to leave yourself exposed to criticism. If someone can't criticize you after you write your, you know, it can't be critical of your behavior at all after you've written your mistake essay, you probably aren't answering, answering it terribly honestly. You have to take ownership of the problem. This has to be part of, you know, part of your problem. And you have to, em- you have to emphasize what have you learned. You know, maybe, maybe a follow-on action where you can discuss how you performed better in the future. Um, you know, the, the goal really here is to, is to take responsibility, show learning growth, and, and maturity. Um, so don't try to shift the blame, hide from the problem. Don't try to choose something trivial, like I copied the wrong file and my boss was annoyed. That's, that's not something where there was soul searching. And don't write about a failure or a setback where, you know, I, I, I love sports analogies, so, you know, I twisted my ankle and couldn't apply, for, couldn't uh, try out for the basketball team. That's not a mistake. That's a setback. It's not something where there's ownership. Oh, you know, I was silly and that I was careless and twisted my ankle. It's not going to work. So um, here's one of the examples from the beginning. Manage a high performer's ego and facilitated um, team growth. You know, here's an awful example would be the high performer was terrible on teams. He left, and good riddance. I, sh- I should have fired him before he left. You know, that was my mistake. I should have fired him. It's not, it, that's not a story that they're gonna that they're gonna appreciate. You know, not great. High performance was difficult. We all thought so. His ego problems became too much. Even my manager noticed. You know, I should have gotten tough earlier. I learned my lesson. Okay, so it's not awful. But the good here is, is where you take responsibility. I, I gave this is my fault in some ways. I gave a, a guy too much leeway. I lost control. Um, I had to seek outside intervention from my boss. It wasn't my boss noticed. I, I had to go to him. Um, you know, I regained control, stayed firm, and then I changed my approach in future circumstances. And that change of approach in future circumstances is part of the learning, right? The learning needs, the learning needs to come from the anecdote. A lot of people will say, um, you know, I, I got into a tricky situation, won't describe it, and then will say, in the future, I need to be more forceful or something like that. And it doesn't, it needs to relate directly to the anecdote. Um, optional essay one, what would you like us to know about your undergraduate academic experience? So, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult. But everyone's undergraduate experience is quite different. Um, <clears throat> I think that, you know, you should know that a broad survey is acceptable. If you want to tell the story of, of you know, of, of several years of, of intellectual growth, that can work. I think that what, what they're not looking for is a review of your transcript. You know, th- this is not an opportunity to go class by class or for you to explain a bad grade. If, you know, if you can show um, what you were, if you can reveal what you were excited about academically and show that through courses, and it, it doesn't all need to be related to your major. You know, it doesn't need to, you don't need to say, hey, I'm a poli-sci major. This is how I explored my major. This is what excited me. If you had one class in Renaissance art and you were, uh, you know, the rest of your classes were in economics, that might be really interesting in terms of your intellectual growth. Um, so you want to you want to engage the reader in the story of, of how you developed intellectually while you were in school. That that's possible. A favorite project, you know, this is a disguised example, but I built a motorcycle. Um, this individual was a, was a, was in an engineering class and he spent two years building a motorcycle from scratch. You know that that, that that slightly disguised was a little bit more sophisticated than that. But you know this was he just told that story in 400 words. Um, here's an individual at a unique project conducted research and published with. You know, had a very long relationship with the professor, and ultimately published something under his name, which is really rare. And you know, it was just a, a very different story. But even something as simple as having a, a really close relationship with a professor who was a mentor who would challenge you, um, you know, that's all fine. Again, what would you like us to know? What would you like us to know? Not tell us about your entire undergraduate experience. What would you like us to know about your undergraduate academic experience? Okay, so this is not the opportunity to talk about how you, um, you know, how you were, you know, really busy with extracurricular activities. Um, you know, if you were a poli sci major and your extracurricular activity was putting on the poli sci conference, okay, you know, that that might be relevant in terms of you know how you learned um, from that experience at the conference. You know, some of the speakers that you interacted with. But you know, if you were a poli sci major and you were on the lacrosse team, 200, 300 words about lacrosse just not relevant. Um, 
And you don't need to lead us inevitably to business school. It, you know, the, the end of this does not need, need to be, and I found myself firmly on track towards a position that would lead me to business school. It just panders, and it's very, very disingenuous. Um, what is your career vision? And this is one, I've said this before, but I think it's important and, and worth repeating. Um, you know, a, a lot of people feel they must answer this question. And, you know, it, it's, it's, not a, it, it's not mandatory. It's optional. So, you know, again, D. Leopold, and I, I'm not sure, Eric, if, if she said this when, when you were there as well, but I, I think she's, in the past she said, you know, career goals are, 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 are a crapshoot, and, and, uh, and she sort of views them with a, she takes them all with a grain of salt. You know, she's interested in what people have to say and their vision, but she knows that most likely people aren't going to stick with them. Um, and... for short and long-term goals. It doesn't mean you need to say, I'm going to set the world on fire and embellish, but they want to see some imagination in what you're doing, or at least you know, a vision for where you're going. So an individual who really wants responsibility and, and has impact and wants to enter into the startup world and, and, and join a variety of startups through, through the course of his career and, and lead them, you know, that, that, that could be a vision for his career, or a person who's fascinated by a certain part of the world, or an industry, um, or a technology, um, or just someone who finds purpose in a type of work, you know, Problem solving, um, you know, and, and trying to trying to trying to create a you know trying to create a story around you know why you're that kind of person. There there isn't there isn't a right answer here. There isn't like a okay this year Harvard is looking for private equity people. Last year it was looking for consultants. This is an opportunity for you to spell out what's important to you. Um, and you know, yeah, be, you know, be be ambitious, be rational, but you don't need to be earth shattering. You just need to be personal. You just need to own this story. The story needs to be to be yours. You know, think to yourself: Is this the type of story that someone else is telling? It, you know, it, have I personalized it? Have I connected it with my experiences, my interests in a way that it's it's indelibly linked to me? Um, and then don't ignore the second part of the question, which is why this choice is meaningful to you. And I think that a lot of people just answer their career vision and, and, and give very short shrift, you know, send it to the end and really explore. You know, they want to know that you're driven, that there's purpose. You know, so, so why are you pursuing this? Not just what you're pursuing, but, but why? And you know, it's the same thing with Essay 1 where, where they say, you know, what are your three most substantial accomplishments and why do you view them as such? Don't ignore the question. Tell us about a time in your professional experience when you were frustrated or disappointed. I think a lot of people perceive this to be very similar to the mistake and are going to shy away from it. Like, oh, my God, you know, here I am. I'm back. And it's only two essays later, and I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely you know, bludgeoning myself here again. And that's just not the case. You know, take a look at the individual who overcame internal skepticism and developed fit, a fitness program with no budget. You know, the, he didn't necessarily make mistakes. It's just that there was, there was organizational inertia. There were different uh, priorities. There, was, there were all sorts of reasons why it didn't happen, um, but you know we're going to learn about this individual making do with with uh, with a few resources and actually overcoming. So you know it, there's less ownership here, you know, in terms of owning a mistake, and it's just it's a narrative about I think predominantly overcoming obstacles. And again, like Harvard is looking for real people. They're not. They're not looking for people who are just absolutely perfect and never face obstacles and cruise comfortably to victory every single time. And in fact, winning and losing isn't relevant. You know, if this person didn't overcome internal skepticism, and uh, you know, he tried and tried, and and no one really went to his fitness programs, and you know, he was frustrated by it. So be it. You know, the, it's it's the uh, you know it's the effort that's important. And and in this case, you know, this individual could reveal skills, character, diplomacy, determination, thoughtfulness. Uh, but I'm sure there's much more as you, you know as your individual story goes. And then finally, here we have um, you know essay four, where um, you know we have this is a new one. I think it's going to puzzle a lot of people. You know, here are a couple of anecdotes from which to draw. This is what's left for this individual. But you know, you get to bring them in thematically, talk about all of them. You know, they all kind of um, show a certain kind of you know passion and creativity. Uh, you know, everything from you know an individual who's not passionate doesn't take his grandmother to Hungary for a week. Um, you know, this is this is an individual who's initiating, creating opportunities for himself and others. Maybe maybe he creates a a narrative about that theme in his life. Um, there are a whole bunch of different approaches to this. You can be incredibly creative with this one. You can you can use humor. It's not a, it's not a, a must. You can make this um, you know very interesting. You can reveal your personality. It's very hard to 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 uh, to, to advise broadly. You know, I'm guessing the 400 people who are on this call right now um, on which approach to take. You know, you have to really own it. But the thing to avoid is not turn it. You know, you don't want to turn it into a biographical statement. You you know, you, this is not 
the the, the whole history of, of Jeremy Scheinwald or Eric Bond, um, you know, and 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 you probably don't want to start with my name is Steve and I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You know, a lot of people are going to start with the easiest place to start is is chronologically, and again, people are going to get very very bored by that opening after a while. Make sure you really grab the person by the lapels and, and shake that person. Um, and do not turn it into a YHBS. You know, just they're not asking for it, and and you don't want to spend your whole time talking about, um, you know, the class of 2013 and how HBS is great. It, it's not going to impress anyone. You, know, you might allude to a contribution you're going to make if it's relevant to to the uh, to the type of person you are, but it's certainly not mandatory. And and I would say do it very very cautiously. And with that, that actually it actually brings us to the to the end. Um, and I'm glad because I, we've got about 20 minutes left for some questions. Um, I'm going to talk just briefly about. Uh, so uh, you know, as um, as we mentioned at the beginning of the introduction, you know, I I, uh, I started this firm as a speechwriter for an ambassador, and really, get communication is still at the core of what we do. Um, you know, we're not here to turn awful writers into fantastic writers or turn fantastic writers into award winners. We're here to help you communicate at your highest level. If you communicate at our highest level, it's not going to be um, you know, it's not going to be uh, credible. Um, you know, I'm a professional writer, but we're here to help you communicate that which is interesting about about you. Uh, we're not a website. There are a lot of admissions websites out there. We're a firm. We're a real firm. We have a full time team. Um, you know, I'll bring over our our blog and our books in a second. Um, you know, we. We uh, we're already working for you. We we we've already we're writing books. Actually, our complete start to finish guide is going to be released at Barnes and Noble and Amazon.com this month. Um, and uh, you know we have we have the external validation of of working with Manhattan GMAT who selected us uh, to work. So much of this, I want to leave questions uh, time for questions. I am going to pull open our web page. Uh, Eric, can you can you can you see it? Yeah. This is David, actually. So. Um, oh, sorry, David. Sorry. No worries. So we can see your uh, web page just fine. No worries. Great. So did you see, you know, there's free consultation. My mouse is on it right now. There's a, there's a free consultation. Um, you know, we're happy to chat with anyone for free. You can provide us with a little bit of information, and um, and we'll have the context to have a productive conversation with you. Uh, we have our blog, which is incredibly robust. Um, you know, we have our. Uh, a weekly GMAT challenge from Manhattan GMAT. We do our professor profiles on a weekly basis. Um, so that's something I, I think is something only we do, um, where we profile a different professor for a different school each week. Um, we do our admissions myths destroyed with Beat the GMAT. We have a, a, a writing tip. I think we actually have a, a write like an expert here. You guys can see we're, uh, we're advertising for this series. Um, but here's our admissions myths destroyed, which was uh, which was posted posted on Beat the GMAT as well. We have admissions tips. We have a, a Monday morning essay tip. We have essay analysis on other schools over here. Essay analysis um, on other schools aside from Harvard. There's a lot here, and it's all free. And we're we're very happy to offer it to people for free. And then we have our store as well, where again you can get our guide series. We have our insiders guides, very very thoroughly researched guides to the schools of your choice. And uh, and our complete start to finish guide, which is available soon. And I, I think I'm going to close that and and leave it at that. Um, I think you know I'm not going to talk too much about our services. Here's just a sample of the type of person we have on our staff. Monica Carpenter Okra, senior consultant. She went to Harvard Business School. She wrote a book on how to write effective Harvard Business School application essays. Um, you know, you look at Angela Guido went to Chicago Booth. Um, she went to Yale. She was the uh, manager of the Yale Record when she was at Yale. She actually helped research and write a, um, a bestseller called Treasure Hunt, uh, which is a business book written by a BCG consultant. Deb Fryer wrote 16 Harvard Business School cases and then went to Wharton. Um, so, you know, pretty pretty strong staff. And with that, um, again, free consultation link is right there. Uh, you can get a free CAT exam from Manhattan GMAT, our partners, and I'm happy to take whatever questions we have with the time we have left. Great. Um, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, this is David again, uh, CEO of Beat the GMAT. Um, yeah, we have a couple questions, and I um, uh, wanted to just first of all say great stories. Love the um, uh, actual example essay. It was very powerful. So we have one question from a couple people who said, you know, helping my grandma or grandpa, why is that special? Like, how would you work that into an essay? 
Uh, yeah, and, and, and again, you know, like I think the people are often skeptical of the pieces that really allow them to differentiate. I mean, this is, it, you know, it takes a lot to, to, <laughs> I'm not too, 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 too uh, you know, callous about this, but to, you know, to wheel an old lady around, around hungry for a few weeks. I mean, you know, that's that's really an undertaking, and it shows a, a real character in this person in terms of you know respect, you know, certain values and respect, and and um, you know, not everyone is going to do something like that. In fact. In fact, no one is going to do something like this. This is a slightly disguised case, and we've only seen one person have anything even remotely similar to this. So, um, you know, it, it's an interesting piece that shows, you know, a certain kind of interna- international curiosity as well, which is a nice little side effect. Um, but it really, it, it's, it's multidimensional, and it, it reveals a lot of character. And the schools don't want to know that you're just work, 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 work. You don't have to tell a personal story. It's an option. If, if you don't have this option, don't go looking for it. But in this case, this person did something very special. And the depth of the experience, you know, the the 200 words, the 400 words that, that he wants to um, commit to it will reveal that, you know, it, just, you're right, you know, if you just took a trip with your grandmother for a week, it might not be that special. But in this case, you know, it was a respect for heritage and a, a voyage of discovery, and there's a lot going on. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. You know, I must confess, you made me feel a little guilty because my father himself is um, disabled, and he got hurt about five years ago. And, uh, you know, when he said people don't want to just see people working, 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 um, my brother actually moved into our parents' home and is really helping my parents a lot. So uh, I totally understand why helping your grandma could show a lot of great character. So I'm going to go. Th- you know, and that's and and he did it with with with. He probably doesn't even see it that way because it was meaningful to him, and so that really says something about him. Absolutely, and he's been he's been living with my parents for about five years now, helping them you know get around, helping my dad get around a lot, and it's just unbelievable. So let me um get to another question. So uh, question is, what if you worked a lot in undergrad and had to spend three extra years to graduate because of that? How would you how would you talk about that in an essay? Um, you know, I, I think that that's, um, you know, obviously all these things are very case specific. It depends on your performance and it depends on, you know, did you, were you taking a, a couple of classes, uh, you know, at, at, at night every year or were you, did you take a semester off and go back or whatever it is? Um, you know, it, it's something that, you know, the, your, the admissions committee is going to see your transcript. They're going to see how, you know, how you did and when you did it. And, um, you know, it might be a really interesting story, you know, just because you weren't, um, you know, on the typical, you know, four-year track, it, it doesn't mean that you're automatically disqualified. Let's understand why you did it. Let's understand, you know, why it was it was meaningful, how it shaped you, and and just move on. You know, it it it, it doesn't, you know, it it might on, on the plus side, it might make for a very interesting story. Um, you know, about how you how you manage your undergraduate academic uh, curriculum, and. And uh, you know, on, uh, at, you know, worst case, I guess it's just it's something that you might just explain in, the, in an optional essay or additional information, and just and just explain you know why your why your transcript has is a little bit patchy. But it you know as long as you did as long as you did well and 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 were productive during that time, if you really put yourself through school, that's that's a character piece for you. Great, thank you. So um, another question that just came in is, you know, can you explain? why the Introduce Yourself essay for HBS should not be biographical. And this person confessed that their essay actually is biographical. So uh, I think what your answer might be able to change, affect their actual application this year. I, I, I suppose it, it, it could be biographical. I should, maybe I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. I mean, I, I think that, I don't mean, you know, that it, that it should ne- absolutely never. But I mean, for the most for the most part, it just shouldn't be a chronology of life's events. You know, I was born in such and such place. I went to elementary school. You know, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be an encyclopedia entry on your life. It should be, you know, we should, you should try and pick and choose. I, I recognize that a chronology is a very easy way to write because it allows you to organize your thoughts, but you know, it's harder to start in the middle or just start with a, a you know a theme in your in your life or you know something that's really driven you. But I just I think that you know uh, you have to be very very careful. I'm very glad you asked that. So um, <clears throat> I wish there was a way of identifying you. Maybe there is. Maybe maybe uh, you guys have that person's ID and I'll send you a, I'll send you a free guide. Um, but um, so just just email the beat the GMAT guys and and they'll let me know. Um, <clears throat> but. Um, uh, you know, just you just have to be very careful about. You know, you're not just offering basic information; you're offering the story of who you are. Yep, absolutely. I think I think that goes back to the point you started with at the beginning, which is you have to tell a great story, and that's the most important thing 
rather than just trying to speak to HPS per se, it's much more about telling the great story. So I have another question for you about um, uh, from one of our uh, listeners. Um, so, uh, you know, does a mistake have to impact others or my organization? So would a wrong career choice work as a mistake or does it have to impact other people? I mean, you know, the question is, what have you learned from mistakes? So, you know, if you made, um, you know, if you made the wrong career choice, if you found yourself on the wrong path and and you stuck with it for the wrong reasons, maybe you felt like, uh, you know, it, it's wrong to leave a job after after three months, you know, just out of undergrad, and then it's gonna, you know, put a scarlet letter on you or something like that, and you stuck with it for a year and you were miserable. That taught you something really important about purpose in your work and maybe you know maybe you make meaningful values choices from now on fantastic fantastic you know it, there's, there's, it doesn't have to be you know you don't have to have created a disaster there just needs to be some growth from the mistake and that's why that's why mistakes like i handed someone the wrong file i knew i had to be more careful eh, you know not really a lot of a lot of personal evaluation and digging and reassessment you know it's it's that's just changing a habit um but you know if in this case i think that there's probably a very good story that goes along and and says you know where you can say you know hey i i'm i had to really do some soul searching and that that's great absolutely <clears throat> so thank you again for that one another question that just came in is this you know we talk a lot about growth and how you need to show a growth trajectory in your career um you know this Reader asks a very interesting question. Like, what if your salary doesn't trend upwards? What if you made a job change and your salary actually went downwards instead of going up? You know, I'm, I'm sorry, a tiny bit just cut out there. Can, can you repeat that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we talk a lot about growth. And so one of the career growth, well, one of the uh, listeners asked, what happens if I change jobs and my salary actually went downwards instead of going upwards? Okay. Describe that in an essay. Uh, again, you know, very very case specific, and it really depends. I mean, if you change, if you're making a, a change in your career that was meaningful for you, and you were switching out of an industry that was high paid to one that you know, just didn't have the same kind of payment, you know, no big deal. I mean, if you took a if you took a job in the exact same industry and took a step back, you know, probably something you want to you want to explain, you know, how, why. Um, this is something that came up a lot with uh, with people who were laid off during the recession. The schools know they're not going to say, okay, the the, uh, the you know the, the global the responsibility for the you know global recession lies at your feet. You know you have to you have to take responsibility. You had a slightly lower paid lower paying job after you were laid off. Um, you know the, the schools are they're they're just they they just are for the most part looking to understand what you're about. They're not they're not here to be punitive and say okay this person's salary dropped by five thousand dollars he's not Harvard material he's not Wharton material. They want to understand what's going on and why you made that choice. Why did you make that choice to move on to to the next um, to the next job that was lower paying? You know what what was the purpose? And, and you should be you should be fine. They're they're they're, they're it's not an over, an automatic disqualifier. There really aren't any. So, Jeremy, another question is um, comes from a, uh, a listener. She says some sources encourage building a constant theme or brand. You disagree. Um, can you explain that? Some 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 asked to build a, a theme over the course of their application. I disagree. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So they said Go some. Back to that first, yeah. yeah. Some sources encourage well, a constant I, theme. Some yeah. some who some. S I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. I I, I didn't hear one keyword. Some. Yeah, it says, uh, I'll read it again. Some sources encourage building sources, a constant okay. theme or brand. Yeah. You disagree. Can you explain? Yeah, I mean, you're just, you're not a simple product. You know, you're not a, you're not tied or something like that. You can't be some, you're a human being. You, you can't be summed up in, you know, in, uh, in, in, in six words. And if you can, you know, if, if I'm just Jeremy the Entrepreneur and, and I'm writing about that in every single essay, it's going to get quite boring. And there are people out there who can offer entrepreneurship and can offer, you know, community leadership. And, and, I mean, and again, these are just minimums, you know, what did I do as a community leader, whatever it is. There, there are people who have a variety of interesting experiences in life. And my example of, of Bill Gates, you know, he's not a one-dimensional person. And nor is you know Jack Welch, and and to be an effective business leader, you know you're you're not one thing. You're not a spreadsheet machine or a you know um, uh, you know a, a marketing whiz. You know you're you're a lot more than that. It's great that you are that. 
but let's understand that you have the, the, the potential for growth and development and, and that you're someone who's going to be, you know, pushing yourself forward in a variety of different areas. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think you can ask any admissions officer and they will, they will tell you, you know, not to try and develop, uh, you know, a theme. It, 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 it kind of weaves back into what I was saying before about underestimating the team and underestimating admissions officers. You know, they're not here to find a cute theme. They're here to to understand who you are as a human being. And again, I, I can scroll back here, but, um, you know, it goes back to, you know, what, what D. Leopold said herself, um, which is, you know, um, you know, consultants can help you with anxiety around what a business school wants to hear, which is exactly the question you shouldn't be asking. You should, it should be, what do you want to say as an applicant? What do you want to say as an applicant should not be, I am one-dimensional, in my opinion. So great, thank you. We have time for one last question. Oh shoot! <laughs> no worries, Jeremy. Uh, we actually, um, uh, <laughs> you're you're fine. Um, so we actually have time for one last question. Um, so the question is: Is can I compensate my low undergrad grade or GPA in the essays? If so, how should I go about doing that? Um, I mean, I, I don't really think that it's in your essays. That's that's the that's the spot to discuss your your low undergraduate, you know, your poor undergraduate performance, especially in the what do you want us to know about your undergraduate essays? And that's just, you know, I, I suppose it could be done tactfully. You know, there you could talk about, you know, potentially if if you were in the wrong field to start and then you made a transition and you really turned on, you know, your your academic performance really turned, you know. Um, improve dramatically and and you really found a passion you know maybe you tell that story but I, I don't, it's not a, in our opinion this is certainly not the spot to review your transcript um, you know most schools will offer an optional essay or some uh, room to offer some additional information and um, and that's the place and and if you do offer some additional information you know you know just really you know, make sure that you're again taking responsibility. You're not making excuses. This wasn't because you were busy with you know extracurricular activities or um, you know you want to be very very blunt about and very direct and take responsibility for you know for why your grades are poor. It doesn't mean you have to you know have to beat yourself up over it. You know if you if you worked you know uh, you know 30 hours a week you know and, and uh, you know and, and had other you know family responsibilities or whatever you know just just tell the story. Don't blame it. Just just tell the story of, of why you didn't perform well, and it'll give you your best chance to uh, your best chance to, to, to overcome that obstacle. Great, thank you, Jeremy. So that's all the time we have for questions today. And so I know a lot of people ask questions, and so if we couldn't get to your questions, our apologies. You should feel free to post those questions to beat the GMAT forums. Uh, Jeremy, as well as our other business consultant partners, will be happy to answer the questions and field them in our forums. Um, I have a couple quick important announcements. First is, um, please make sure you go to mbamission.com to check it out if you're interested in uh, talking more with Jeremy um, and his team. Second, we will be actually, um, we'll also be releasing the video broadcast as well as the presentation on our site um, within the next couple of days. So if you missed any part of this or want to review it or want to see the slides, please come back to our site uh, sometime in the next couple of days. We'll have it go live there. And third, and this is a most important announcement, uh, Beat the GMAT is going to make a huge, huge announcement tomorrow. <laughs> I, I'm not going to reveal any details, so, so we're going back to Jeremy's theme of create some mystery. <laughs> we're going to create a huge, huge announcement next, uh, tomorrow on our site, so just be sure to come back tomorrow and check it out in the morning. Um, that's about it. That's all the time we have. Thank you very much. If, if, if I may, guys, if I may, I really want to thank you for having me. And, um, you know, all you out there, we're going to do this again for Kellogg soon. And, uh, but this is a really great, uh, really great series. And, and uh, you know, Eric and, and David and B really deserve a, a pat on the back for putting this together. I think it's going to help a lot of applicants and, and help a lot of applicants for free. So that's great. Thank you so much, Jeremy. We're, we're really excited. We have Stanford GSB tomorrow, and we have a bunch of other uh, sessions for the remaining four to five weeks. So please make sure to tune in. And you know, whether you're RSVP or not, doesn't matter. Just please show up, and we'd love to have you. Thank you, everyone.